We were basically over January started working on an idea to help people pick what classes they wanted to take. Uh, and then Michael uh, brought to my attention that there was actually a competition to uh, help MIT students. So we decided to pursue the project further and actually create something that would help students decide what classes work best for them. The coolest thing we've probably done is we've created a recommendation algorithm. So basically, by collecting a lot of data from people entering their schedules, we're able to compare your schedule to other people who've taken similar classes and thus recommend a class that we think you may enjoy. Uh, this is currently missing from all of MIT's services and other student-made websites. And we think it's really going to help students who don't really have an idea where they want to go with their uh, majors. So our idea is a lot of student-made websites, especially for this competition, focus on what to do when you already know what classes you want to take and help you figure out the order you want to take them in. So our idea is we're going to collect a lot of data from people who've taken classes already and then use that data to help you decide what would work best for you. OK, so this is the home page of the site. So after you've entered your information, you can see a nice, clean visual display of all the classes you've taken and followed by all the ratings. So you can change your ratings based on you know, how much you like a specific class. And then you can go, say you want to learn more about a specific class, you can click on the link, and it'll come up with the class's profile. So for example, you can see the overall rating, the rating in your major. You can see a histogram of when people take it. And then you can find out what people take with it and after it. So you can find out popular things to take uh, as you move along your MIT career. Another cool feature of our site is that you can see um, schedules like mine. So in a major that we have a lot of data for, like mechanical engineering, you can see an actual course road of uh, a senior and see what it takes to graduate. And another feature is you can see what you should take next. So this is the, the personalized recommendations of our site. So for example, for me, since I've taken these uh, mechanical engineering classes, it recommends that I take another one, 2671 and 2008. MIT students really need a lot of stuff because they're so busy. They need a lot of tools to help them do the things that they need to get done. And so competition like this, there are a lot of ideas flowing to help MIT students make things a lot more efficient for them. Um, so I created this cool app and website, which, let you, which lets you um, locate your friends on campus. And I thought it would be a great way to spread it with the MIT community um, to submit it to this competition. MIT Locate is a service that runs on Android phones, and it's also something that you can access from, from your browser. It allows you to locate uh, yourself and your friends on campus. And it, it's better than the existing tools because it actually uses Wi-Fi to, to locate you, and it has a, a huge database of all the access points that are on campus. There are over 4,500, and a lot of them are inside uh, like each, each room. So the service can tell you exactly which, which room you're in and which room your friends are in, and it lets you um, map them out and find, where, find what, what they're up to. So this is my app. Uh, the Friends tab is the default tab. It shows a list of your friends and which locations they're at. Um, if they're not available, it says it's not available. But otherwise, it would show where they are and the freshness of, that, of the location. So it says this person was in the, st in the data center two hours ago, and this person is in Massey Hall uh, 36 minutes ago. I'm currently up here. This is my, my name and my location and the floor that I'm on of this building. Um, I think people who have great I ideas about how to make the student experience at MIT better should pursue their um, their passions in, I mean, it, if, I don't know if it's web development or app development, whatever it is. If, if people have a good idea for how to improve student life, they should look into competitions like this to um, get the word out about it. So my name is Brandon Muramatsu. I'm pleased for everyone to be here today for the 2014 iCampus Prize. I've asked BJ to say a few words about the background on the iCampus Prize, and then we will go into the presentations. BJ. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Vijay Kumar from the Office of Digital Learning, the Office of Education, Innovation, and Technology. This is the welcome, everyone. And this is the sixth uh, episode of this uh, uh, of this uh, award and the iCampus Student Innovation Prize. Uh, and it, the, the whole uh, series was a follow on to a very, very important project, a project that uh, with Microsoft Research uh, that has really led to a lot of significant educational technology innovations uh, at MIT, many of which you see uh, in various forms, in various avatars, things like Teal, the iLab project. Um, and. Uh, uh, following that that uh, uh, project, uh, what uh, through the through the fine uh, guidance of Hal Abelson over here and Paul Oka, 
who have been original members of the uh, steering committee of our campus, uh, we launched this initiative with actually with some money that was left over from there to say it would be wonderful if, uh, if we could use this to uh, energize student technology, uh, innovative applications that our students develop uh, that touch on learning and living at, at MIT. And um, it was uh, a first a prize, then a competition, then a prize. But you know, the, the, the goal was really to capture the innovativeness that our students already have and direct them towards the kinds of wonderful applications that you see. So very happy that uh, people are still participating. And one of the things that we have seen is uh, uh, the applications that come out of this, which is again not new to MIT, uh, actually become part of the infrastructure and services at some point that MIT offers to its students. You know. So this is a great way to generate uh, applications from the first-hand needs that our students identify, you know, like you did, and and develop these applications. So I think that's that's good enough for intro. Hal Abels and Paul are the folks that who have really. Uh, uh, help guide this effort right from its get go, and of course, uh, Brandon, who has been uh, who has been orchestrating this process for the last three or four years now, you know, in its in its current version uh, as a competition. So welcome. Thank you, Vijay. Um, so we have two presentations here today. First, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Daryl and Michael, of of course, to talk about their project, and then we'll get to the second one after that. We'll go for about 10 minutes, maybe five minutes for questions and answers. I'll be keeping time-ish. Um, so take it away, you guys. My name is Daryl, and my partner Michael and I have been working on creating a site to help people pick what classes they want to take. And so the first thing we did was identify the problem. Now this past semester, I was looking through a big list of classes on what I had to take to fulfill a certain requirement for my major, the AUS requirement. But the problem is, there's a whole bunch of classes that I had to then look up in the subject catalog to figure out more information about them. But then I had to keep going back and forth between the catalog and the list of classes just to see what each class was and what the options I had available. But that's not even enough. Then I had to go looking at the subject um, evaluations to see that if a class I was potentially interested in was really any good at all. So then I had to look through all these three different pages, opening multiple tabs for each thing just to compare them, and then finally decide on something I wasn't even sure I was going to enjoy. And so the main problem we found is that when students don't know exactly what they want to take, although MIT has a lot of information to help students, the information is in so many different places that it's a big hassle for them to figure out what exactly they want to do. So in this talk, I'm going to first go over on what exists to already help people pick courses, then what we've done uh, and the differences between ours and theirs, and then finally what we plan to do in the future with our project. So this is an image of picker.mit.edu, and it shows it, it's a site that helps people decide on what courses uh, and would work in a schedule. However, the issue here is you have to already know what you want to take, and then you can see if it will actually work in a schedule. The next thing is CourseRoad. CourseRoad is a site that helps you show prerequisites for classes and also if you fulfill your, the requirements of your major. However, still the issue is you have to know at least some sort of list of classes you're interested in to even put them into this chart and see how they all line up. And then finally, last year's iCampus winner, which class, uh, shows you a lot of information about courses and their statistics in terms of subject evaluations. However, you don't necessarily pick a class based on whether the exam covers all the material. It has to be based somewhat on your interest. And so again, you need a list of classes to start from in order to use this evaluation to any effect. And so of all these alternatives, the main idea is they have a very specific thing that they fulfill. Uh, but the main thing is you have to already have some idea of what you want to take in order for these sites to be useful to you. And so I've got, uh, and then, so most people, they use these sites, but they have to ask their friends first about what potentially to take. However, friends are often in different majors or with different interests, and so they can't be the best people to give you advice. And people also talk to their advisors about these things, but advisors also don't know everything. And they, there are 4,500 classes MIT offers, so that's just too much for people to grasp fully in their head. And so now I'm going to talk about what we've done to address these issues that we've identified with the other options to help people pick classes. 
And so the way other sites organize course browsing is a linear structure, usually alphabetically ordered. So for instance, the subject catalog or picker.mit.edu, you'll see classes in, for example, course six, listed as 600, 6002. Uh, these basic ranking in terms of alphabetical order doesn't show you the links that each class has to every other class. And so with our project, we wanted to create a sort of web for you to browse classes in. So you could go from one class to another. Maybe you enjoy a particular class. You can move on with a sense of causation of one class caused you to enjoy another class. And so this led us to create an idea of basic themes we wanted our site to have. First is entry of data. If people are able to enter their data, our site can become more personalized to their needs. Second is organization of data. If we have a lot of people entering information and MIT has a lot of other information, it makes sense to have a site to aggregate it all in one place that it's easy for students to access. And then finally, recommendations. If we have access to a student's class list, we can provide good recommendations for what they may be interested in taking in the future. And so the basic way our site works is you first, we give a link to a student's undergraduate degree audit. This is an already available uh, service by MIT that has a student's all, uh, classes all listed in one place. Then we ask the student to copy and paste this information into our site, uh, and then we parse that in PHP and then store it in a database so that when the student visits our site in the future, they can just log in with their certificate and all their data will already be there. This is a very quick process for a student. And so basically, we turn a student's undergraduate degree audit, which looks like this, into a much more appealing format for people to see what classes they've taken and offer them the, abil the ability to rate the classes they're in. And so uh, if you look at this, this is basically the home page for a person at our site, and you'll see they're able to rate their classes, and then each of these uh, entries in the table is actually a link to the course description of that course. So uh, this is, for instance, one for 7012, I, Introductory Biology, and we show both the average overall rating, the rating in the major. We aggregate the subject catalog and course evaluations data in our site uh, that's easily viewable, and then we also, at the bottom, give students an ability to browse courses horizontally. So starting if they en enjoyed 7012, they're able to see what a lot of people who also took it took afterwards. So this gives them a better way to browse courses than the linear approach given by the subject catalog, which is just organized in alphabetical order. Next, we talked to the dean of students, uh, Dennis Freeman, and he told us that advisors are wanting more tools to help students uh, pick classes. And so what we developed was a chart to show exactly what people in specific majors take at what time. A lot of freshman advisors are humanities professors who don't really understand what each class means in the context of people taking it. So what we did is we created this chart to help illustrate exactly if a person is trying to switch majors, what they would be expected to have taken at a certain point in time. Uh, another thing this helps them do is, for instance, a lot of advisors in the past said uh, students had to take chemistry before taking biology freshman year. But as we can see in this chart, a lot of students actually prefer the alternative option of taking biology first. So this helps keep advisors more up to date on what are, uh, students are currently taking. Next, we have a list of other people's schedules. So you can say, if you're trying to switch majors, the ones in green that are highlighted in green are requirements that you've already fulfilled in common with that person. So if you're looking to switch from computer science to mechanical engineering, you can see if you have a lot in common with someone, perhaps it's not so hard of a switch, whereas other major switches may be more difficult. Additionally, if you look at a senior schedule, you can see how exactly they manage to fulfill the requirements, because you know they're there, but you don't know exactly in which semester people take take things. So we hope that this will be a benefit that, in that point too. And then finally, we have an algorithm to help people decide on what classes to take. Based on the classes that you've taken, if you mouse over our recommendations, it'll tell you exactly what classes you took that caused us to recommend a class to you. And I'll go it over in more detail how exactly our recommendation algorithm is made. Uh, so this is what we plan on doing in the future, especially in regards to how the recommendation algorithm works. So right now, the recommendation algorithm uses Bayesian inference to compute a probability that you'll take a class in the future based on the classes you've taken now. We aggregate a lot of information from other classes people have taken. So if you have classes in similar with someone and they end up taking a class, say, advanced algorithms, then it'll be more likely to recommend advanced algorithms to you. The issue with this is it's less easy to scale as we get more and more information because there are a lot more classes you can take that other people have taken. There's, it, the web essentially gets more tangled. 
field. So what we're moving towards is a machine learning algorithm that lets us pick the best classifiers instead of using all of them, and it weights the classifiers based on how they best match the data. So we're planning on using boosting, which is a system of combining weak classifiers. So for instance, if taking a certain course is highly correlated with giving a five-star rating to another course or not taking another course, then those classifiers will be combined to be able to recommend to you whether or not you should take another course. This is extremely flexible and scalable because basically anything can be used as a classifier and it combines the best ones to make a recommendation. And so in conclusion, uh, the other alternatives to students looking to find out what classes to take essentially rely on students already knowing a sort of list of classes they may want to take. And so what our site does is we c calculate a whole bunch of data that students have entered in order to give students an easier access to the, the information the administration already provides and then also information that uh, based on our recommendation algorithms we'll recommend. And then we're in the future looking to improve on the recommendation algorithm as we get more users, it'll only get better. And then also add additional features based on feedback we receive from the administration and students. All right, thank you. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Michael, too. So right now we're using Bayesian inference, which is basically have you or have you not taken a class. Uh, yeah, but with boosting, we're going to be able to be a little more flexible in adding additional classifiers. So perhaps one classifier is have you rated a class, a specific class, with three stars or more, indicating interest in that class? Or are you concentrating in a certain major or minor? Those things could all be used to create a sort of overall indicator of whether or not a class is for you. Uh, yes. Um, on the uh, slide with the horizontal graphs, um, with the horizontal bar graph, what's the x-axis? It's just percentage of people. So from zero to 100 uh, percent, what percentage of people took each thing? So you can see it's very common for freshmen in the first semester to get credit for uh, physics and calculus, and most also do introductory biology over chemistry at that time. Uh, so it's basically just a histogram giving you some sort of sense of what's popular for students in that position. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so I saw the causality graph. Uh, is that basically just a graph of prerequisites? You are just navigating it, right? It's, uh, at the very beginning? Yes, at the very beginning. So that was a picture of Course Road. It's a, another site that was in the iCampus competition. And that, yeah, that just shows prerequisites. And we think that's, although that's good, a lot of students don't necessarily pay heed to what prerequisites classes have. And so what our site will be able to do is, if a lot of people only take a certain class after having taken the prerequisite, our recommendation algorithm will only recommend it if you've taken the prerequisite. But for some other classes where that's not as big an issue, it won't be hindered by the fact that it's listed as a prerequisite. Okay, and uh, so uh, one more point about the uh, recommendation algorithm. Yeah. So it seems like you guys want to go to boosting, but this, this seems like a perfect uh, place for collaborative filtering, and it seems like there may be even existing uh, algorithm that you can just use. You can just plug in data and tell it the features, and you can try it out like immediately, so you don't actually have to build the boosting yourself from scratch. So we actually don't have to build the boosting from scratch. We're just using an existing boosting algorithm that we're just going, it's basically we're going to test it. We think that boosting has a high chance of success because there's just so many factors that can factor into whether a student likes or doesn't like a class, and so boosting is going to be an easy way for the computer to figure out which factors are most important. Uh, and it's a lot less work on us to have to basically, I don't know, organize another system. Yeah. Right, yeah, so the, the only reason I said that is uh, your situation is very similar to Netflix uh, recommendation of movies. Uh, people watch movie and then they, based on the friends or maybe uh, people who have yeah, close, yeah. Uh, have a close flavors of uh, favorite movies. And, and that's what they use, uh, collaborative filtering, and it's been studied, uh, yeah. it's been uh, extended for quite a while. So The, the uh, only, I mean, we'll definitely look into it, but the only difference between Netflix and this is Netflix is mostly, you can watch a movie at any point in time, but certain classes are going to be more for freshmen, and certain classes are going to be more based on uh, other stuff that you've already done. So we'll definitely look into it, but uh, that, that's basically our reasoning. Yes? How do you factor this? Application play out in the world 
There are lots of courses online with lots of takers from different. It sort of gets to a, you know a, a, the Amazon kind of model, where, where there are. But you know, I'm imagining where, uh, a place of lots of online courses from multiple sources from multiple institutions. So, I guess we're not, we're not really looking at the the like scaling this up to that size would probably require something different. Uh, but the fact that there's only 4,500 courses here, uh, it just makes it a lot easier of a problem for us. Um, but definitely, if we're looking at you know having a large educational platform, uh, such as edX, for example, uh, it would be a slightly more difficult problem to be able to exactly predict stuff like that. Um, but based on the fact that we only have about 60 users worth of data, and just using Bayesian inference, our recommendations already uh, seem to recommend classes that would be required to graduate or make sense based on classes you've taken. So even with just a little bit of data or having a slightly inefficient algorithm, the main premise behind our site, uh, I think, will work out. How do you think about requirements, So we're basically not tied down to requirements. Uh, so the issue is, I guess, if, if students uh, always have taken one class before another, uh, suddenly stop doing so, then uh, it may be sort of tied to the past, but we can always just advance our machine learning to only take data that's more recent. And I think a lot of requirements change because students like start not taking certain prerequisites or stuff like that, which right. our system will pick on to earlier. And then potentially our system could be a way to recommend the administration to change a requirement. Yeah, that's really interesting. Maybe one more question? Yeah, sure. Have you factored in demographics at all in your recommendation engine? So we haven't yet, but the idea with boosting is it's very easy to just say, if you're in this major, if you're this old, that could be a classifier. Um, it's more, we don't really know how likely those certain things will matter, but it's going to be very easy to feed that information into the machine learning process and then see actually you know, how, how relevant those things are. But you have to factor in your data collection classes as well. Well, we already take account of a student's year, uh, major, that sort of information. We don't want, basically, everything that's in their undergraduate degree audit is very easy for us to put in. We don't want to hinder the process of a student entering data. In the future, we may allow a student to add additional data uh, if they're interested in uh, obtaining a better recommendation. Uh, but that's something I think we'll see essentially how well our algorithms work with just the data that's basically required uh, and move on from there. Okay, guys, thank you very much. All right, thank you. And next up, we have Aiden talking about MIT Locate. Hello, I'm Aiden. I'm here to talk about MIT Locate. So simply put, MIT Locate is a location sharing service for MIT. Um, it's comparable to Apple's Find My Friends app, and it's also similar to Google's Latitude, which is now part of Google+. Um, it's different in a few ways, though. So here's a, here's a picture of the MIT campus. Um, if you use one of these ex ex existing services, you'll be lucky to get an accurate dot of where your friend is located. Um, you'll also get a, uh, you'll get a little pop-up if you hover over it with the person's name. And, if you're, and if, again, if you're lucky and if Google knows about the building, you'll get the name of the building. But with MIT Locate, but only with MIT Locate, will you get a specific name of the room that you're in um, with very high accuracy. So the use cases for this app are uh, finding out what your friends are up to, alerting you when a friend arrives at the meeting location, notifying you when friends are, near, are nearby, which isn't implemented yet, but that's a pretty key feature that I, that I do plan to add. Um, and it can also be used to monitor the location of your device. If you, have, if, you set the privacy, if you set the privacy setting to private, then only you can view your location, which is useful if you want to locate your, your device, uh, which you can do through the web interface. So this is the Android app. Um, this is the default screen here. It shows your friends. It shows a list of your friends. It shows where they are and which floor they're on and how recent that lo location data is. Um, so this is the default interface. This is what you see when you first op open it up. And it's a very easy way to quickly find out what your friends are up to. Um, here's another screen. If you tap on a particular friend, you can get to this screen. It shows that, it's, that your location is shared with that person and it gives you a bit more information. Um, you can also easily stop sharing your location with that friend or take them off of your friends list too from, from, right, from right there. Then let's look at the alerts tab. So the alerts um, are a, a system that allows you to 
set up a notification for when one of your friends leaves or enters a particular building or room. So if you want to know when someone leaves 10 to 50, you could easily add a location alert, which will, which will send you a push notification for when that person arrives. Um, in the settings tab, we have a few settings. The, the most important setting, though, is the sharing mode. So the public sharing mode is designed to share your location with anyone in, in the MIT community. Um, then the, the, the limited sharing mode, which is the default option, um, allows you to share your location only with the individuals and groups that, that, you, that you can uh, specify. So you can, if you choose this one, then you have to ex explicitly give access to your location uh, to each person that you want to be able to see where you are. And then there's the private mode, which I mentioned, which, uh, which does track your, your location in the background, but it, but it does not share it with anyone. And that's useful if you, again, if you just want to find out where your, your device is. So here's a little demo. So let's say that, um, that, you, that there's some girl named Jane Doe who's in the student center, and she wants to find out where I am. And she sets up an, an alert. So she goes on her uh, browser, and she sees that she's in the, in the student center on floor five. And she's waiting for me to come meet with her in the, in the student center to, to work on a project. So she, she looks at where I am. She, she hovers over my name. Um, and Simmons Hall, which is where I currently am, um, is indicated on the map with the little red icon there. So it shows where I currently am and how old that data is. So as of 13 seconds ago, that's where I, that's where I was. Uh, but previously, she had set up an alert. So as soon as I enter the student center, she will find that out by seeing a post notification saying that I've arrived in the student center. Okay. Um, the, imp the implementation of my project relies on Wi-Fi. So it uses the access points that are already on campus. There are over 4,500 of them. Um, and each of them has a unique identifier known as the MAC address, which you can use to identify which room you're in. So this room in particular has two, um, and, these, and those two access points can be used to, uh, to determine that I'm in this particular building. Sorry. Well, it, it can be used to identify the building, the floor, and then in some cases, the room. In most cases, the room. There are some rooms that don't have any, so it's kind of hard to find out in those cases. But in most cases, you can also find out the room that someone's in. Um, it doesn't use tri tri triangulation, which is what a lot of apps do, because um, there's a lot of noise that's introduced by the fact that there are walls. Um, so to compensate for that, what I do is I have, for all of the rooms that I have information about, I essentially go to the room, I record all of the access point signal strengths from that particular place, and then I and that adds it to my known locations database. And from that database, I can figure out which location in the known locations is most likely to be where you are right now. When I go back later and want to find out where, where I am, it can determine which, which of the known locations I'm most likely at based on the signal strengths from the nearby access points. So it compares to the known locations. So this is a phone. Um, here are some access points. And it, it uses the signal strengths from each of them to determine that. They're measured in, um, I believe it's decibel milliwatts, which is a unit of power. It's actually a, a ratio of powers, which is often referred to as the signal strength. Um, and it's also usually a negative number, so a closer access point would have a smaller um, signal strength. And that is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Do you do, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, you, uh, in one of the pop-ups, you mentioned you can add or uh, hide friends and groups. So is there a way to create groups in the app? That is not currently a feature that I've imp I, I, I have imp implemented yet, but yes, I do plan to do that. It currently lets you only specify which individuals you would like to share your lo lo location with. So yes, if you have a small group, it probably is just easier to add them individually. Yes? Other questions? As part of this, you were saying before that as part of this, you use Google's location service, and yeah. then you say, so how does that all fit together? So the update frequency is based on two different factors. It updates every 30 minutes, but then it also updates whenever Google tells my app that the device has moved a certain amount. I believe it's 100 or 500 meters or something like you that. Can it. But right, so I I can change what that is, um, and that accounts for if you're in the same place, you want to get a you want to verify where they are. So if they're in the same place for a long period of time, you also want to have a fixed interval, like every 30 minutes. Also call 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 back to the server and verify where they are. No, I still don't get it. So the Google location service tells you what room you're in or approximately where yeah. you are or at MIT or? No, so the Google lo 
location service is used only to detect if a significant location change has occurred. It yeah. does not tell you which building they're in or which room they're in because uh, it, it doesn't know most of the names or names or the building numbers or anything. So all it does is it, it is used to identify when the user has moved a certain amount. And then once it does that, it can call back or it, it can scan for the Wi-Fi networks because it knows that it's moved. So it knows that it needs to check in again and update its location on my server. OK, other question. What API do you present? Because this is a wonderful service. So what, you know, it's, it sounds, you know, you, you have alerts and you have various things. But it sounds more more useful as a platform. So, what API do you present? Uh, so, curr currently, the API that my Android app uses allows you to request the location of a friend, and if and it checks the permissions. So, it, so once you authenticate um, as a particular user at MIT, you can request the location of another user at MIT, and it will return their location if you have the sufficient permission, which would mean your that their location is is either public or it's. Uh, you you are on their list of people who can see your their location. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you.